I think consistency. Consistency is key. I mean, we all have goals. We all want to get there as fast as we possibly can. But you got to be you got to be patient. You know, you got to be consistent and you're going to go through the ups and downs to get there. But it's the people that are consistent and persistent and stay the course that end up making it to those levels. So I think a lot of times you just have to take a deep breath and realize I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing and I will get there one day. Stay in the present moment and quit focusing on that end result. Things end up taking care of themselves when you are in it, putting in the effort, doing what it takes to get there on a daily basis. Have you ever heard the phrase becoming the best version of yourself? Yeah, me too. But what does that even mean and how do we become that person? I'm here to help you navigate through those questions and come up with actionable steps in order for you to live your best life. We've got to discover what we want. We've got to figure out a plan on how to get there, and then we have to go. We can't just sit and wait any longer. Life won't wait on us. So come join me on this constant journey to become the best version of yourself and to find your best you. I'll see you on the other side. All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Nick Carrier's Best You Podcast. I'm fired up for today's interview. I've got the one and only, the legend, Mitch Gaylord, with me here today. Uh, if you guys don't know who Mitch is, Mitch, back in 1984, was won the gold medal um, with the U.S. men's gymnastics team. Um, he also won three other medals, the silver um, in the vault, and then two bronze medals in the parallel bars in the rings. So back in 1984, the L.A. Summer Olympics, which is awesome. Um, so I appreciate you coming uh, coming on with me today, Mitch. Yeah, my pleasure. It's great to be here. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Well, basically, the way I want to start is I always try to get people's background to give the listeners a little bit of perspective on kind of where you came from. So I'm interested is as to when did you start doing gymnastics and how did you kind of get into it? I, I actually started fairly old, uh, 12 years old. Uh, before that, I was just like most kids out there. I wanted to do baseball, football, and basketball. The problem was is I was pretty small for my age. So as other kids were maturing and getting bigger... I was staying pretty small and uh, my mom was smart enough to notice that one of my passions was diving, just flipping and twisting off a diving board. And I would jump off my roof as well, pretending I was Superman. So I always had this love and this feeling I wanted to fly. And she said, you know what, let's put you in a trampoline class. There was a local Valley College. Uh, We live very close by. And she put me in that class and immediately I knew I had found my home. Uh, just bouncing on the trampoline, that feeling of flipping and twisting and flying in the air, it, that was it for me. And it wasn't until several months after that that the coaches said, you know, there's this whole sport of gymnastics that you'd be really good at. And that's kind of how it got started. That's crazy. So somebody, it was your mom be kind of realizing this, was it an ability or realizing a passion in you? Like, it, or is the combination of the two that you thought? Yeah. I think the passion developed later in life for the love of the sport, but okay, the, um, ener- the energy that I had, um, I was a pretty hyperactive kid, so it was tough for me to sit still. So I think my mom viewed it as an outlet for all that energy in a controlled environment where there was actually coaches that could help me uh, put that energy to good use. And, and that's really what happened. Uh, it always cracks me up because the coaches looking back, they were only in their early 20s when I was 12 years old. And these guys were kind of reckless as well. <laughs> and, uh, and we had these, this kindred spirit of risk-taking and pushing the envelope and seeing what the human body was capable of doing. So it was a perfect environment for me and my personality. And I would just bounce on that thing for hours and hours. And like I said, then they said, you should really try gymnastics. There's a whole sport. And they had a local gymnastics team out of LA Valley College. And that's what I ended up uh, competing with. And my favorite part of the whole thing, and probably what kept me in the sport for so long was the trips. Uh, The first trip I went on was to Hawaii and I had never been out of Mm -hmm. Los Angeles, California. I was like, wow, you know, we can go on these trips to these beautiful places in in our country. And I'm in, I'm all in, let's just keep doing this. Yeah. I think it's awesome that, I think it's cool that they pushed you towards gymnastics because they like realized that like you need to channel this ability and this passion towards something that's actually useful instead of just bouncing up and down on a trampoline with no real aim or real no intention about it. Um, so you start when you're 12, which is crazy that I'm that 
to hear that because I feel like so many gymnasts start just like at bare minimum age, a like bare minimum level entry at like three, four, five years old. So I think it's really cool. At what point did you realize that it was something that you wanted to really fully commit to and that it was something that like you might be able to do at a super high level? Yeah, that, that actually came late for me as well. So I started late and then the passion and the drive also came late. Mm -hmm. And I would say I went through the whole uh, club ranks uh, from 12 till about high school. And then when I got to high school, I realized, oh, wow, you can be part of the team and compete against other high schools in the city. And that kind of gave me that little bit of drive and that competitive spirit kind of woke up in me. Mm -hmm. And by the time I was a senior in high school, uh, I was at a pretty high level for Los Angeles and I won the high school championships, but I had never competed on a national level. So after um, that happened in high school, I went to the junior Olympic trials and that was the first national competition with other high school athletes from around the country. And I flew to New York, uh, my whole family flew out there as well. And I had relatives in New York. So it was, you know, a lot of support. But anyways, a very funny thing happened to me during the warmups of this competition. I started looking around, got completely distracted by how great everybody else was. And I started having these weird feelings of, of I'm, I'm not worthy of being here. Like I got yeah, intimidated yeah. basically. And so all that self-confidence that I had developed uh, in Los Angeles went out the window. And I literally believed that everybody else there was better than I was. And I basically choked in this competition. So back then we had compulsories and optionals. You had to do both of them to get your all around score. The compulsories, if you don't know what they are, it's basically um, the boring stuff that everybody has to do. And you try to do it better than everybody else for extra points. Um, I basically blew 50% of my routines in that competition. And by the time it came for the announcement of who made the top 12, because that was the goal. The top 12 athletes got to stay with USA Gymnastics, all the head honchos there, for a two-week training camp. And everybody wanted to be there. So they announced uh, the top 12. And guess what place I came in? <laughs> 12. 13. 13. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so um, I was devastated. But it was a huge life lesson for me because it was all up here. It was all mental that put me in 13th place. Obviously, if I just did a tiny bit better, instead of missing 50%, if I missed 40%, I would have made that group. But what it did for me, is kind of that turning point in life where you know you go to the fork in the road and part of your brain says, I'm giving up, this is not for me, I knew I shouldn't have done it, I don't belong in this arena. And the other part of your brain says, okay, we got some lessons to learn here. That was mm -hmm. the most humbling experience ever. And now it's time to really light the fire and really get that passion going and put in the work. And that's when that competitive spirit went to a whole other level of dedication, discipline, determination, and to vow that that was never going to happen to me again. I was not going to let my mental mindset mess with me like that ever again. Right. Well, I want to acknowledge you for taking that right fork in the road because I think everybody in some instance in life in some instances in life on a bigger scale on a smaller scale, depending on the person have those types of moments because everybody has self doubt, self limiting beliefs and whatever it is that they do. Um, I think with sports, it's super apparent, but everybody has it with their own jobs, their own business, whatever it is. So talk to a little bit more about how we can eliminate the self doubt or maybe not even necessarily eliminate it, but just choose the proper fork in the road. Yeah, I think you nailed it on the head. It's hard to eliminate it when you're growing and you're moving up that ladder of success. It's going to hit you. There's no question about it. In sports, it's it's on a public stage, and that's what makes it um, that much more intense. Uh, the sad thing for me to see is when people aren't on a public stage and it's all internal, mm -hmm. and you let that internal self-doubt, self-talk, um, stop you from moving forward and achieving your goals. And it's all within you. So nobody's really putting you uh, to the test because they don't know what you're going through internally, but you do. And to me, that's the sad part is that we have to really be courageous and get through those stages. And I think it's the recognition and the understanding that it will happen. It happens to everybody. And it's not the fact that it's happening. It's how you deal with it that means everything. So mm -hmm. if you recognize that, okay, I had a little bit of a setback, 
And now I'm going to redouble those efforts. I'm going to learn from the mistake and I'm going to push through it. it. It's right on the other side of that. Success is right on the other side of that. And I think if people just stay the course and be persistent uh, and committed to what they're going for, you do find success on the other side of self-doubt. Right. And, uh, you know, we touched on it. It's not about eliminating, eliminating it. And it's like the whole idea that courage isn't, you know, not, not seeing or not having fear. It's about having the fear, but still moving forward anyway, because right. it's, it's always going to be there. Mm -hmm. It's defying it. There, there's, there's, I, I do this, um, speech called raising the bar. And in the speech, I have a video of the first person who skydived from our atmosphere that I can't think of his name right now. I'm going blank for some reason. It's been a while since I talked about it, but Baumgarten is the more current guy that did it. And basically you go up as high as you can, like 19 miles into the, into the sky. And this guy was testing what the human body could with, withstand as you drop through all of that. And on the video, you see him going way up there and looking down at the earth, <laughs> you know, and mm -hmm. he's taking that step. And that step to me is, is I don't, I can't imagine any other fear that anybody could face that would be more terrifying than that. It was the unknown. Nobody had ever done it. Mm -hmm. And he did this, this was in the 1950s and he dropped out of his capsule, what he called it. And he was free falling and he was interviewed about it. And he said the freakiest thing for him was when he jumped out of it, he felt that something went terribly wrong because he couldn't feel anything. And he turned back to look up at the capsule that he just jumped out of. And he said the realization that it was flying up in the air at like astronomical speeds, it finally dawned on him. That was him dropping, not the capsule going anywhere. Right. He was in space. Right. And there was no wind. So he had no sensation that he was actually dropping till he busted through our atmosphere. I mean, mm. this is like mind boggling stuff. And of course he survived and uh, it was an incredible uh an incredible show of courage, uh, faith <laughs> in, your yes, in, the, in your team. But I always go back to that anytime I'm facing a fear. Sorry for the long explanation. Asia. No, no. I like that, it. We have no fear. Right. Seriously. Um, so one thing, one thing I think is very unique to people who are successful in whatever it is that they do is this attribute or this quality to take action and to follow through with the promises that you make to yourself. Because so many of us, have to-do lists or have things that we know we ought to do in order to reach a new level or le reach a new level of success. But I feel like so few actually follow through with those promises that you try to make to yourself. So what I want to ask you is how did you hold yourself accountable to following through with those promises to getting things done and to consistently taking action? I think it all has to do with how powerful your vision and goal are for yourself. So if there's no passion in that, you will not do what it takes to get there. If you have, I think Tony Robbins calls it a magnificent obsession. Mm. <laughs> and that's what I had going towards a gold medal. That's powerful. And when that goal is powerful, and when you define it as something that you must have in your life, then the days that you wake up and it's hard to do what you need to do to get there, your brain overrides that because of how powerful that drive is to get to where you wanna go. So I think it's it's about setting up the game so that you win. And by that, I mean finding what drives you, like what motivates you to go to those heights. What is it for you? It's different for everybody. Yeah. Well, tell, how's it, how does that self-discovery process work? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, and it, it doesn't just come to you. Like I was lucky at what, I guess, 16 or 17 when it finally started kicking in that I wanted to go to the Olympics and that there was a path to get there. But most people go through life, it's not, it's not so crystal clear to them. So they try a lot of different things and they find that as they're on that path, they're not putting in the work, they're not doing what, it's, what it takes to get there. That's your first clue that you're on the wrong path. You know, People who have that passion each and every day, that's your key. That means you're on to something. This is what you're meant to be doing. Mm -hmm. So what was your driving force to continue to work, work and work um, over the long haul? I just had this burning desire, like an incredible burning desire to make it to the top of the sport. And it wasn't for the result of winning a gold medal per se. It was more about me achieving what I set out to do. I wanted to make my mark on the sport of gymnastics. I wanted to do something that would last longer than me. 
And it was an expression of my creativity, the sport of gymnastics. So I came up with two skills that are still named after me to this day, the Gaylord flip and the Gaylord two, they're high bar moves. They're very risky high bar moves, but I felt like I, I um, elevated the sport to a whole new level. People do it to this day, my, my skills that I invented. And, and that makes me so proud. And it makes me feel like I contributed to a sport and it's going to last longer than my lifetime, right. which uh, is really gratifying. Yeah, that's super cool. I mean, I've, the first thing that came into my head when you talked about the, the two moves that you or the two skills that you invented that you came up with is when you talked about that guy skydiving for the first time, there's no fear greater than doing something that nobody else has ever done in the past. So talk a little bit more about like how you came up with it and how you took that risk or leap of faith of creating something completely new. Yeah, well, it was literally a dream. So I woke up out of a sound sleep and I had dreamt this move that nobody had ever done on high bar before. Back then, all the release moves, when you let go of the bar and you flip and catch, it all usually happened on one side of the bar. And I thought, wow, what if you could fly up and over the bar? You'd have to rotate more. So it was a one and a half front flip over the top of the bar and catching it on the other side that made it unique. Um, I also had a great coach who believed in me and I walked in the gym the very next day and I said, coach, you're not going to believe what I dreamt last night. Do you think this is possible? And he looked at me and he said, well, let's try, <laughs> let's put it in the spotting belt. And a spotting yes. belt is basically a safety belt. You're on cables and the coach has a rope, a pulley system. So as you're swinging around the high bar and you let go, he can yank on that rope and make sure you don't hit the bar or land on it. So that's what happened here. I didn't I didn't hit the bar. I actually caught it on the third try. Okay. People, people in the gym were like, oh my God, they were blown away. And it gave me that feeling of, I mean, to be honest, it made me feel special. Like, wow, I've got something here. I've got something to show the world and I'm gonna make people notice me. And mm -hmm. I'm here to stay and I'm here to do something special. And yeah. that was the start of it. And that was kind of my motivating force right there. That's cool. That's awesome. Were you ever worried that like people were going to see it and be like, what, who does this guy think he is creating his own move? Uh, I never worried about it. I, I thought I, I will gain the respect of a lot of, I, I was a freshman in college when this happened. Yeah. So I gained the respect of seniors who had been in the sport for a while and were winning, you know, the NC2A championship medals. And so I actually got to compete in the NC2As as a freshman on high bar and I think I blew it. I think I blew it in, in that competition, but they had seen me catching it during the year. So okay. uh, once you do a trick in international competition, then it becomes named after you. So it doesn't even matter in the U.S. what you're doing. And I was able to do that uh, shortly after those uh, co that competition. Yeah, even though I told you before, my mind messed with me at the <laughs> junior Olympic level, it still continued to haunt me once in a while. And it was kind of that reminder that, yeah, you got to get focused, man. And let me tell you the key to that right there. there. Yeah. An important lesson I think I learned along the way. Just because you set something in your mind and you say, I'm never going to let my mind um, take away from what I'm capable of doing, doesn't mean it's not going to happen. <laughs> right. And, and the way it doesn't happen, this is the huge lesson, is you got to put in the work. You got to put in the practice. You have to put in the hours of discipline so that when you get into competition, everything you practiced for all those hours is second nature to you. It's like ingrained into you that I'm going to catch this skill because I've done it hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times before I go into competition. And yeah. that's really kind of the, uh, the behind the scenes look at any athlete. They're putting in the hours. Yeah. So I have a couple kind of questions to stem off of that a little bit. Before, right before you went into the competition or you went into your routine, did you have like specific self-talk practices that you went through? Um, I'll just go ahead and start off with that and then lead in the next one afterwards. Yeah, it, it was more about um, not getting sucked into distractions. It's very easy to be distracted uh, by the crowd, by television cameras, by looking at other athletes who you think are doing a great job too, which there's plenty as you get up the ranks, everybody's really good. So it's kind of getting into your own world, tuning out the outside world and getting into what athletes call the zone, the athlete zone. And you really go down to the first moment, like when you jump up to the rings and your hands grab the rings, that's where your focus is. It's incredible mental focus. It's, it's 
called present moment awareness and the spiritual people all talk about it, but that's basically what it is, is putting yourself in that frame of mind where it's you on the apparatus and you're mimicking what you've done in practice over and over and over again. When you land and stick the dismount, that's when you let it all come in. <laughs> and that's yeah. when that's in celebrate the success. Right. Well, I think that's a huge lesson in sports and outside of sports, especially nowadays, because I think focus is probably like the rarest talent or skill that people have. And that's like the skill that people need to work on the most because with everything in our society today is trying to distract us and trying to gain our attention, whether it's TV commercials, whether it's our phone, anything like that, it's always trying to gain our attention and distract us from what we actually need to be focused on to hone in and be, and be successful at whatever it is we're trying to do. So I think that's a huge lesson inside and outside of sports. Um, but you know, you talked a little bit about the focus right before and then how you can celebrate right after when you're in the middle of a routine. Is there anything kind of going through your head? You talked about how it just kind of comes second nature if you prepare, 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 prepare. So like what's the going through your head during it or is it simply just doing? It's it's doing. You're, you, you're kind of aware, like when you do something exciting, like, like the Gaylord flip on High Barn, you catch it. You hear the crowd, you know, erupt. You hear the mm -hmm. applause. And you let that in, but you're still so focused on what you're doing up there. Like I said, you've practiced these routines over and over and over again for so many times. And your job in competition is to repeat it, basically, to duplicate mm -hmm. it and not try to do anything extraordinary over and above what you've done. That can get you in trouble, too, especially when you have adrenaline. Like when you go into these Olympic Games and competitions at those levels, your adrenaline kicks in. And you have to learn how to calm that down a little bit and not let it take you into areas that you're not comfortable with. The coolest part of adrenaline, I'll just tell you this, is in strength. Because when you're training day in, day out for hours and hours, you're not as strong as you are when you taper off and then you get ready for a competition. Uh, you're super strong in the competition. Mm -hmm. And that feeling is awesome. I mean, it makes me think of UFC fighters or boxers or whatever who cut weight right before the competition. So they've been training with this extra weight on them the whole time. They're slower, they're, um, they're, they're not as quick twitch, but when that weight comes off, oh my God, it's a whole other, other level of yeah, Superman, right? Definitely. <laughs> and, uh, and you have to learn how to deal with that and not let it get away from you. It's kind of cool. No, yeah, that's the thing that's really important. Um, so throughout this process, did you have any one particular mentor, or one particular coach that was most impactful for you throughout your process? I did. If you, if you remember back before we competed and you wouldn't remember because you're a young dude, <laughs> back in history, before we competed in 84, uh, Kurt Thomas was our best gymnast and uh, he was a world champion, but then we boycotted in 80. So he kind of missed his opportunity there, but he ended up doing this professional gymnastics tour uh, when I was in, uh, in college and uh, I met him in Moscow for the world championships. Uh, I was the alternate on the team there. I was uh, eighth place, so I had to sit out. And uh, Kurt and I got a chance to talk on the flight back to the States. And he said to me, you know, I don't understand why you're not leading this country. You should be number one in the country and uh, you're in eighth place. What is going on with you? And I said, Kurt, you know, this has been my challenge, you know, ever since I started this sport was the mental side of it and how to get that confidence and belief in myself that I was worthy of being in that top echelon. And he said, the only thing you need to do is train harder on two events, which were my two week events, pommel horse and parallel bars. They happen to be Kurt's best events. And he invited me on the pro tour. He said, why don't you get away from the environment you're in right now and come with me on the pro tour. And rather than competing and worrying about competitions, let me show you how to perform in front of an audience and enjoy that experience because that's really what it's all about. And while we're on tour, we're going to train on your two weakest events more than any other event. We're going to bring them up to the level of high bar and rings, which I was really good on. And that's what we did. So we trained really smart, not necessarily harder than everybody else. Mm -hmm. But in my opinion, in a super smart and intelligent way, we worked on my weaknesses, the weak links. And we got them to a super high level. The greatest thing Kurt taught me, though, was that love of performing and going out in front of a crowd and really showing off what I was able to do and expressing the love that I had for the sport through that process. Uh -huh. and it made the world of difference to me. Uh, I never felt pressure anymore 
of competing. I just went out into these competitions and shined. And it was just like, I put in the work and all of a sudden the belief started to kick in that, hey, I'm meant to be at those top levels. So long story short, 1981, I was eighth in the country. Then I started training with Kurt. 1982, I was second. 1983 and 1984, I was number one. So that's yeah, the that's progression that happened in a very short period of time, just because of mental belief and putting in the work. Yeah, no, I think that's really cool. So I actually interviewed Scott Hamilton to the uh, figure skater. And that was one of the things that got him over the hump. He hated training figures, which is kind of, you know, he, you had that one weakness, the thing that you just didn't want to do, but the thing that you just had to do to kind of up your game. And he just yeah. decided that he was going to train figures over and over and over again. And that was finally the thing that took him to the next level. Um, and his um, yeah, I mean, think about it in real life. If you had one thing that has been identified as the one thing that's holding you back from achieving your goal, if that goal means enough to you, you will put in the effort on that one thing that's holding you back. And that's what Scott's talking about. That's what Kurt did for me on Pommel Horse and Parallel Bars. And ironically, uh, Parallel Bars, I got a silver medal at the Olympics. It became one of my best events. And Pommel Horse, uh, I scored a 9.95 in the Olympics, even though I didn't medal, I was super close. So, yeah. You know, it just goes to show you, uh, your weaknesses, uh, it's not permanent. If you put in the effort, there could be that one little thing that clicks that gets you over that hump at some point. Mm -hmm. point. Right. I think that I just started to think about it. I wasn't even going to ask this, but I feel like defining weaknesses isn't somebody, isn't something that necessarily just comes easy to everybody. I think that sometimes it can be hard to figure out what it is that particular thing that I need to work on and hone in on in order to elevate my game. So how would you, you know, recommend to somebody to dive deep within themselves to figure it out what their weakness is that's holding them back? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think there's a fine line to it because we're not going to be great at everything. We, mm -hmm. we do have weaknesses and you know, what's a strong point for one person Maybe something that you're just not meant to be doing. And that's what's called delegation. <laughs> yeah, delegation. Right. <laughs> if you can't overcome your weaknesses, you find somebody and you team up with them that can that can do that. That's in real life. When you're talking mm -hmm. about an athlete who has to be good at everything in order to get to the highest levels, then you really do have to have a, an identification of it. Coaches can help you identify that and help you work on your weaknesses. The worst coaches in the world, though, they only let you focus on your weaknesses and they don't let you feel good about your strengths. And that was what Kurt was great at. Like I said, we're going to work extra, extra hard on those weaknesses, but he didn't squash my pure talent, which was high bar and rings and dismounts and flipping and twisting. He let me shine also at those places to make me feel good about myself as well. So there's a balance involved. Yes. Why is that so important? Because otherwise you just feel like it's all work and no play. You know, it's mm -hmm. like nobody wants that. You want to feel good about what you're doing as well. You're spending four to six hours in the gym. You need to be having fun and, and really connect to the love of the sport and what you're doing. Uh, this one thing is like my pet peeve when you see parents who are living vicariously through their kids and putting them in these environments um, to go to the top. Because uh, they want them to go to the top. Well, if you don't see that in your kid, if they don't have that burning desire, like I told you earlier, I had, then man, you're doing a major disservice to your kid. You have to let them find their path and find out what they're meant to do in life and then let them shine with that. Kids are smart. They they know what's in them and they also know when it's not. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, I'm interested to see if there is any one maybe decision that you've made in, in your career um, or it may be experience that you had that was the most important decision that you ever made, but you didn't really see the significance of it at the time. Like any thing that you did or anything that you decided to do or any experience that was just like super impactful, but you didn't really realize how important it was going to be at the time. Well, I think, I think leaving UCLA on a full ride scholarship to go train with Kurt, that has yes. to be the number one smartest decision I ever made, even though I didn't realize it at the time. I had a super strong gut feeling that I needed to get out of the environment that I was in um, because the, the coach there that was training the all-around athletes, I'm not here to throw him under the bus, but we just had a major difference of opinion on how to get me to those higher levels, and he was not budging. And so it was an environment that I knew wasn't the best for me, and Kurt gave me this opportunity and my parents, um, 
who were smart enough and supportive enough to recognize that, hey, uh, even though our son is leaving a full ride scholarship here, um, you know, we're going to give him our blessing and let him do this. You know, I had zero money at the time. Right. Uh, and it required them helping me out financially to go train with Kurt. Um, but more importantly, it was them saying, oh, my God, he's like leaving a full ride scholarship at UCLA to do this. And I don't think that's every parent's number one choice for their kid. But mm -hmm. they trusted my gut instinct on it. Um, like I said, looking back, it was the best decision I ever made. At the time, I, I didn't know if it was the best decision. I just had a super strong gut feeling that I needed to do it. Mm -hmm. So it really just all came, it really came down to trusting your gut because I think a lot of people have these kinds of moments in their lives that aren't super obvious to them at the time, but there's a decision to be made and it could very likely make a big difference turn out in their lives. So talk a little bit more about <clears throat> really like going into that decision and and uh, listen, like the importance of listening to your gut and everything like that. Yeah, I mean, my, my gut was super strong and I, I knew that if I didn't do it, that I would be putting myself back in an environment that I felt I couldn't thrive in. And that's, yeah, I think that's really what I'm going to disconnect. What's that? I said, yeah, I think that was really what I was, what I was going for, like the evaluation process of that. And you really saw that you were going to be putting yourself back in an environment that was not to your benefit. So you've yeah. realized that there was just something else out there better for you. Yeah. I, I felt like it was just killing me and that I would never, I would never be able to make it if I stayed in that environment. But you brought up an interesting point because, you know, sometimes you see people justifying leaving a, a situation that they're in, calling it a gut feeling, but really it's an avoidance of going through the work that you need to go through. You know, going to train with Kurt was not all fun and games. It was intense, like super intense. But mm -hmm. I knew that by going through that and putting in those hours and dedication of hard work, that it would result in me getting to the level I wanted to. Um, I guess it's just a cautionary tale of don't don't always trust your gut and justify it by saying, hey, I need to go here. I need to go there. Then you just become a dabbler, you know, a guy mm -hmm. who's constantly avoiding putting in the hours of work. For me, I knew that it was squashing me, the, the environment that I was in. And when I talked to Kurt on that plane ride back to the States, there was a feeling inside of me that I hadn't felt in a long time. I had a coach, an, an athlete that I respected immensely that believed in me probably more than I believed in myself. And by him telling me that it gave, I mean, even now talking about it, I can feel the chills and goosebumps. That's golden, no pun intended, but to have somebody that you have on a pedestal tell you that kind of stuff and I'm going to personally coach you and train you that meant so much to me mm -hmm. yeah it sounds like to me it's just all about really evaluating that gut feeling like you can't just just think it's in a gut feeling and then go for it. you have to evaluate why you're making the decision right but your your why was because I, you knew it was holding you back from being successful or growing in that sport that you were in and a lot of people if they dove deep into why they're making a certain decision, it would be that, oh, maybe I'm just trying to avoid the work. And if they realize that, maybe it's like, okay, maybe that's not the right decision to make. Yeah. I think you have to, you have to just be honest with yourself. You have to trust your gut, but you also have to be honest with yourself and evaluate it, like you said, in an, in an honest manner. And I think when we do that, we always come to the right decision. Right. Did you have any particular moment that was, or experience moment that was toughest in your career that you maybe thought of quitting or like, I don't know if this is for me, any, any sort of like really doubting moment throughout the entire process? Yeah. Before I went to Moscow and when I was the alternate on that team, uh, I competed nationally. You have to qualify to get on that team. And that competition was really tough for me um, because again, I let my mental belief uh, affect my outcome. And I thought, oh, my God, is this going to be this repeating thing as I go up the, the ranks here? Am I ever going to get over this? And I told you it happened to me as a senior in high school. And then it happened again when I thought it was behind me. And that, that was kind of like a double blow of, oh, my God, is this going to continue to happen? And on that trip, um, before we got to the world championships, before I ever talked to Kurt, we had a dual meet. It was USA versus France. And in that competition, I got to compete even though I was the alternate. And I 
was number one. I, I beat everybody. <laughs> and, uh, and that was an interesting thing for me because it was like when nothing mattered, which it wasn't the world championships, it was kind of a warm up meet to the world championships. But when nothing mattered, when I took the pressure off, I knew I had that ability to be the best. And that was a big lesson for me to contrast that with the pressure of making the team versus this competition with France. And I, I realized it's in me. I can get there. I just have to find the right coach, the right mentor to get me over that hump. And that's what became Kurt, Kurt Thomas. Yeah, it just sounds like it was such a mental game for you. It was. It was. I was a very, <laughs> I was very fortunate to be blessed with a lot of talent in that sport. Um, but I also started late, and I didn't start the way most gymnasts do with with incredible fundamentals and a great training program with unbelievable foundations. I had none of that. None of it. Uh -huh. Like my reputation in high school was, yeah, he's got all these big skills. But he, he'll blow it because he's got no fundamentals. And, you know, I proved that to be true many times, unfortunately. Right. So did you feel like that might be one of the might be one of the reasons while you were competing as to why you didn't have some of that self-confidence all the time? Because you didn't come from a place of having started when you were four or five, six years old and having all the fundamentals taught to you at such an early age and starting at age 12? Yeah, very perceptive. That's exactly what it was. And you know, I, I heard all those rumors going around about me uh, by the coaches, by the athletes that I competed against. And, you know, oh, Mitch Gaylord, yeah, he's got all the fancy, you know, big dismounts. And, yeah, he can flip and twist. He's got su he's super talented guy, but he'll blow it. I mean, I heard that a lot. Mm -hmm. And I guess part of me believed it. And it is based on that. It's based on the fact that I wasn't uh, I wasn't put into one of those types of programs growing up. And even in high school, you know, even though I was the LA city champion, I only got recruited by a couple of colleges. You know, there was other athletes across the country. They were going to every single NC2A division one college on a recruiting trip for full ride scholarships everywhere. And I wasn't that guy. And so it made me believe, well, maybe I'm not as good as those guys. And um, I had to overcome a lot mentally, just like you recognize there. Mm -hmm. So how do we, I think there's always a combination of two things that we need to do when we get kind of get negative feedback or, or criticism. There are some negative feedback and criticism that like a lot that you had, you just need to block out and you do need to ignore the noise, but there's some that you need to evaluate and be like, maybe there's a little bit of truth to that. How can I, how can I start working on that and improving on that? So tell me a little bit about like the difference there and how we can either block out the noise or take the negative criticism as constructive criticism and start to work on it? How do we like determine which is which? Well, I think that you do have to recognize uh, some truth in, in that type of stuff. And if you believe it, if you believe it to be true and they're just echoing what you feel deep down, then definitely you have to recognize that's a weak point and I have to overcome it. I think everything uh, comes down to who you surround yourself with. Uh, the coach, the coach athlete relationship is paramount, but it's also the team. It's also the environment that you're with. You need to be around, and this is a life lesson. You need to be around positive people who are all pushing forward in a constructive way. And they're not there to put you down so they feel better about themselves. They're there to help bring you up because we're all doing this together. When I went back to UCLA after my Kurt Thomas uh, experience, I was part of that NC2A team as a senior and our team was was awesome back then. We had some incredible guys on that team and we all supported each other and we all rose to a higher level. When you look at our Olympic team in 1984, um, I always say if we had one person on that team, there were six of us, if one of those six people was gone and another one came in, we would not have won the gold medal. It was a very special group that supported each other and was there for each other. We had an incredible coach, A.B. Grossfeld, that brought us all together and said, we're going to define our team goal first because we need to make history as a team. You guys are all gonna go on to do great individually, but let's make a mark on men's gymnastics in the country. And he kind of set the focus for all of us. And that's what I'm talking about here is 
you need to surround yourself with great people and great leaders. And if you can put yourself in that environment and you could eventually become one of those people, which is what I think happens because you see what's worked for you, it's kind of like paying it forward. Now mm -hmm. you have the motivation and desire to help others come up those ranks as well. But I think it's super, super important. Yeah, I think, I think that's right because when you surround yourself around people who are truly want to see you get better, they're the kind of pre people who will give you that constructive feedback when you need it. Because I think that's the best friends and the best family that we have who are willing to tell us the negative things about us that we might need to work on. And if they're tr if we feel like they're truly looking out for our best interests, then we can trust that, okay, that's something not to block out, something that we need to take in and start to work on. Yeah. And I think it's up to all of us to search out those people that you feel can mentor you in a positive and constructive way. You put your trust into them. And then when they give you that kind of feedback, you have to accept it and you have to understand they're here to help me grow and learn and become more. And uh, right. that's what it's all about. Yeah. All right. So you have all these achievements, gold medals, silver and bronze medals. You were, you have the two new uh, skills or moves named after you. Is there anything that you are most proud of that maybe people don't know about you or that like you don't get asked about all the time? Yeah. Yeah. There, there's one defining moment in the gymnastics career that uh, probably meant more to me than just about anything. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't at the Olympics, even the Olympic, the Olympics meant the world to me also in 1983, when I went back to, uh, to UCLA uh, to train there again, because it's a long story, but basically I could not stay with Kurt on the pro tour mm -hmm. and still compete in the Olympics. So I ended up going back to UCLA and I really didn't want to be coached by the prior coach that was there that didn't believe in me. Mm -hmm. uh, my brother ended up, who was a few years older than me, he ended up working with me within the gym environment. But um, we went to the USA championships in 1983 and I had never won that competition. And people wrote me off in the world of gymnastics. They said, oh, Mitch is no longer training with Kurt. He's over. He's done with. He's back at UCLA. You watch. He's going to you know, go back to eighth or ninth or tenth in the country. And I had this incredible desire to prove everybody wrong right. and become number one for the first time. And that's what happened in the 1983 USA Championships. And this was a private moment. I was on the balcony at my hotel room. I broke every record in USA Gymnastics in that competition. And I was on the balcony with my brother. And we were just hanging out, looking over the city of Chicago. And I actually started to get emotional uh, because it just felt so incredible to me internally to overcome everything that I had gone through to get to that level with all the doubters out there. And mm -hmm. now they had to recognize me as the number one gymnast in the country. And it, it just felt like I can't even describe that feeling, but it was amazing. Uh, I can, I can honestly tell just by like your physiology right now, you just kind of almost went back. Yeah, and I'm freaking emotional right now. It's so weird, you know, cause I'm actually, I can feel that moment right now, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I, it reminds me of, it's not the accomplishment. It's not winning that makes you feel that way. It's the mm -hmm. fact that you overcame the odds, that you stayed true to what you wanted to do. It's almost like the Frank Sinatra song, do it, I did it my way. I was mm -hmm. very unconventional and I, I stayed true to myself. I trained harder than I've ever trained in my life and it resulted in that. So it was kind of like this just sense of overwhelming sense of accomplishment uh, and mm -hmm. living my truth. That's what it was. Mm. That's so cool. So um, I think a lot of people who are probably, you know, similar to my age, early 20s, even like 30, are kind of at, in a similar place in terms of like self-doubt. I don't know exactly what it is I want to do. I, I want to be successful. I just want to break through in my career, all these things. What kind of advice would you give them on terms of things that they can do to either, you know, break through or just start being successful or just start turning their life around in the way that they want to see it turn? I think consistency, consistency is key. I mean, we all have goals. We all want to get there as fast as we possibly can, but you got to be, you got to be patient. You know, you got to be consistent and you're going to go through the ups and downs to get there, but it's the people that are consistent and persistent and stay the course that end up making it to those levels. So I think a lot of times you just have to take a deep breath and realize 
I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing and I will get there one day. Stay in the present moment and quit focusing on that end result. Things end up taking care of themselves when you are in it, putting in the effort, doing what it takes to get there on a daily basis. I'll tell you a really quick story. Yeah. Uh, it's called Pyramid Push-Ups. Uh, at midnight, at every night at UCLA, this is when I got back there as a senior, we came up with this crazy idea after four to six hours of training that we were going to do this little thing extra that we knew nobody else in the country was doing. At midnight, we would converge at somebody's dorm room and we'd go around the room, about six or eight of us, and we'd do handstand push-ups. We did it in a pyramid form formation. So <laughs> we'd go five reps 10 reps, 15, 20, 25, 30. You get the picture. Snark, yeah. snark, the higher we went. And then we'd come down the pyramid. Right. 25, 20, 15, 10, 5. And you'd go super fast. The whole thing took about 15 minutes for all of us to get through it. We were exhausted when we started. We were exhausted when we finished. And we were like, what are yeah. we doing this for? We'd question it all the time. But we always had a good laugh. We always had a great attitude. It always felt like, we're doing that thing that nobody else is doing it. We did it every single night. And the the results is, A, we got super strong by doing mm -hmm. this little thing every single night. And B, every day in the gym, the next day, you could look a lot across the room and you just have this grin on your face. Hey, that guy was there last night. That guy was there last night. We put in the work consistently. And it's those little things that make the biggest difference, I think, in life. Have some fun with it. Find something that is out there that nobody else is doing and it's kind of your thing on a consistent basis to give you that little edge. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So we talk a lot about your gymnast career and, and how that developed throughout that entire journey and throughout that entire process. And now you do, and you've done for years, but done speaking engagements. You know, we talked about your cruise that you went on a number of years back and um, gave some speeches on there. And like you mentioned, your your talk is called Raising the Bar. So what are you really trying to, what do you like to communicate when you have speaking engagements to people kind of about your experience? I, I just try to encourage people to live their life at a higher level and put themselves in that arena where they feel like they're growing. They feel like they have motivation and inspiration towards a vision or a goal for themselves. I think life is a, uh, is much more fun, much more rewarding when you're pursuing something worthwhile to yourself. And it's never about winning a gold medal. It's kind of like setting your vision for yourself, whatever that is for you, whatever motivates you and lights that fire within you. Then, of course, I give them a bunch of um, lessons that I've learned along the way, many of which we're talking about right now, that could help them overcome that self-doubt, the fear the, uh, the, the doing it when you don't want to do it, that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. But it's all in that motivational area. I love talking to high school kids because uh, they're kind of in that, in that place that I always can go back to in my mm -hmm. own life and realize it's just those little key things that mean so much to you to take you to those other levels and, and take on life's challenges and, and go mm -hmm. for it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's awesome. Well, before I ask the last question, um, I want <clears throat> to start off by acknowledging you uh, first, because I think everybody, you know, has those those self doubt, those mental challenges, over and over and over again, and that's those kind. That's the kind of thing that weeds out the weak. And if you stay persistent, you stay consistent with that sort of thing, and just kind of know that there's a light at the end of the tunnel, and that there's going to be better for you um, if you just keep working through it and breaking through challenge after challenge after challenge. Um, that it'll turn out in your favor. And I think that you did that in such a, such a high level in such a great way. And for taking that risk of leaving UCLA, going to the coach, even though a lot of people um, wouldn't have had the courage to be able to make that decision, especially with the financial burden that it may have had. Um, I really want to acknowledge you for those couple of things for breaking through and for making that risky decision. Well, thank you. I, I really, really appreciate that. You know, I don't know if we've talked about this before, but uh, my wife and I, we own, we own some fitness studios, and, and so we get to see people transforming their lives through weight loss and fitness. And I got to tell you, it's super rewarding because I'm seeing them on a journey that I've been through in life as an athlete. And this is kind of their personal journey, their personal challenge to, to as they're getting older, to be in, in great shape. And most of it's mental, just like the stuff we talked about today mm -hmm. and being consistent and putting in the hours in, in that environment. But it's, be, it's become very rewarding for me to help others 
elevate themselves hands on. You know, it's pretty cool to watch that happen. Yeah. Well, so talk a little bit more about like what you currently do. You do some, do you do some fitness coaching too? I mean, I know you have, you guys have the, your wife has a studio and you guys have the studios, but you do some fitness coaching as well. Yeah, I, I do. I, I've been getting more one-on-one -on -one with people in, in weight loss and fitness. Uh, MitchGaylor.com, we're kind of launching that right now to help people more in that one-on-one -on -one area uh, remotely. I know you do the same thing, which is awesome, making a difference in the world. But I, I got inspired to do this because of our, our fitness studios. And you accurately said, this is really my wife's baby. They're called, it's called Legree, the Legree Studios. And uh, this was a, a, a old Pilates, uh, it started out as a Pilates type workout, but it's evolved into something so spectacular uh, called the Megaformer. So it's a much more athletic version of what you might uh, associate Pilates with. So it's a super cool workout, but watching all those people get into great shape, I'm there with them. I'm coaching them and I'm training them also. Mm -hmm. So, but I thought, how can I make an impact on people who are not here with me? And that's why I decided to go uh, through the social media platforms and really uh, help people that way. So, and have fun with it. I think that's yeah. the key thing. As we get older, people look at it as this thing they don't want to do. But, oh my God, they associate so much pain to, to change. Right. right. The truth is you can have a good time with it. And, and a lot of people who've been so far removed from feeling like they're in good shape, all you have to do is get back in the game slowly, consistently, and do it in a fun manner. And you'll get the results and you'll realize, oh, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was. This is actually fun. I'm having a good time. And right. I'm doing something good for myself and getting healthy again. Super important, especially as we get older. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad that you said that because <clears throat> I think it's really important that people realize it's um, – like the best type of fitness is the type that you're going to actually do, the type that you actually enjoy. And I'm doing something right now throughout all of 2019. I'm doing a series called 52 Gyms in 52 Weeks. And it's called, I say gyms, but it's really just place of health and wellness and fitness where I'm trying to go out to as many different styles of places as possible to be able to reveal to other people what's actually out there. Because I think a lot of people boil fitness down to running and weightlifting, and a lot of people don't think that they would ever want to do those things on a long-term, consistent basis. And so a lot of people just think, I'm never going to be fit. But I truly believe nowadays with how much is actually out there and how many resources we have to be able to be, become fit and become healthy, that there is something out there for everybody that they would truly enjoy and truly stick with long-term. So I really think that I like how you said – Figure out what you would actually enjoy because it's all about consistently consistency, like you've already yeah. like you've already touched on. So that's one thing that I'm trying to do. I'm trying to go out and see what all is out there. So when people ask me like what can, what can I do, I'm like, oh, there's all these sorts of things. Like I think you might like this thing and go try that. Um, so I think that's cool. I think that's awesome what you're doing because now you're kind of a a window for all these people into these various workouts. There's so many of them out there. But uh, that's awesome. That's so cool. And, and that's funny because it's similar to what I'm doing with my, my weight loss program, which is called the Try It Diet. Because mm -hmm. I think there's so much stuff out there. It's like, what do you do? You do keto, paleo? You know, do you do the intermittent fasting? Do you do yeah. you know, Atkins? There's, there's like 100 of them out there, right? So mm -hmm. I broke it down into a 30-day program where you basically try it each one a different day. So you got all this variety and you're having mm. fun. You're looking forward to doing something new and unique every day. And the overall theory I have with the diet is um, it doesn't really matter which one you choose as long as there's that caloric deficit. And I think most people would agree with it, even though people try to poo poo it and say, oh, yeah. this doesn't work anymore. They're just trying to get you to do their diet. But the truth is, if you just reduce those calories and start moving and getting active and working out, and picking one of your 52 gyms that you're talking about right. one that you like and love and you'll do on a consistent basis. Getting back into shape is not rocket science. Everybody can do it. And it's so healthy and so wonderful for you. And you'll feel better about yourself. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. So the last question I always ask everybody is the same. And it's about how I think that becoming the best version of ourself is a constant journey. I don't think we're ever at that best version of ourselves. Hopefully on our last day, we can, you know, maybe have that thought that we were the person that we were meant to be. And right. so what I was, and I think it's an individual unique journey. I think that the way I'm going to be, get to the best version of myself is completely different how you're going to get to the best version of yourself. Cause we all have our unique talents, our unique passions that we need to heighten. We can't look at somebody else's passion and abilities and want to get better because they have it. It's all about looking within. 
um, and become the best version of yourself. That's why it's best you. A very yeah. unique journey. So what I want to ask for you, and for you uh, personally, is if there are three things that you could currently do or currently work on to become closer to the best version of yourself, what are those three things that you could do or work on? Well, number one is to go within. <laughs> Number one is to be connected to myself. And I do that in a variety of ways. I do that through working out. Uh, I've done that my whole life and that's my love of fitness. Uh, it's not so much the physical activity of the whole thing, but more the spiritual side of connecting to the athletic side of myself because I believe that's what I've been my whole life. I've been an athlete. And mm -hmm. I find that if I ever stray from that, I kind of get out of, out of balance. <laughs> so yeah. uh, that would be number one. Uh, number two is connection to, to my wife and kids and my family. That's super important to me is to have those relationships um, solid and, and always at the top of my priority list. I think with all the distractions we have uh, in life, it's very easy to put that on the back burner and take it for granted. And I try my best not to do that because as I'm getting older, I realize uh, just just how incredibly important that is. And I, I honestly, I can't think of a third one off the top of my head because uh, those two are pretty powerful right there. Yeah. yeah. Well, cool. Well, awesome. Well, I appreciate you coming on. That was awesome. I know we could have talked so much further about some of those, those, those other things, but uh, that was great. Let me just compliment you really quick because in my 20s, I had none of what you have, the depth of wisdom and knowledge. <laughs> and uh, it's just really uh, f refreshing to see that at such a young age. So keep on your path. You're doing great. Well, I appreciate it. Well, I appreciate you coming on, Mitch. My pleasure. Thank you.